Hi everyone, how are you doing today? I'm Nikki and welcome back to my channel where I talk about historical topics. If you're new here, thanks for joining us. And if you're coming back, still thanks for joining us um, and thanks for coming back. So today we're going to be talking about Sacagawea. We've all learned about the Lewis and Clark expedition in middle school history class, but did you know about all of the tragedy surrounding Sacagawea's life? And that despite this tragedy, how helpful she was to the crew overall. There are many people whose voices have been lost to history. And in this two-part series, I want to talk about those people a little bit more. I want to take the time to fully explain their stories. Those two people are Sakagawea, a Shoshone woman uh, who was very helpful in the Lewis and Clark expedition, and York, who was actually a slave during this time and who came along on this journey, along with Sakagawea, Lewis, Clark, and their other members of the journey. You may have noticed that I'm pronouncing Sakagawea's name a little bit different than what many people are used to, Sacagawea, but um, the reason why I'm doing that is just to make sure that I am as historically accurate as possible. Um, I looked through a couple of different resources, and the most historically accurate pronunciation they could find was Sakagawea. So I will be going with that pronunciation. I'll be focusing in, on Sakagawea in this video and then focusing on York in a separate video because I really wanted to give both of them a wholehearted history and not really mash their videos together. Before we get into it, I just want to apologize um, for butchering any of the French or Native American names that I will be pronouncing. I tried to look up as much of the historically accurate pronunciations as possible, but I can only do so much. So apologies in advance. I will be trying to use written historical language, peer-reviewed sources, and Native American oral tradition to support my findings. So without further ado, let's get into it. Sacagawea was born around 1788 in Lemmy County, Idaho, to the chief of a Shoshone tribe. When she was about 12, she was captured by a neighboring tribe, the Hidatsa tribe. Sakagawea spent about three or four years in captivity within the Hidatsa Mandan tribe, which was a village uh, consisting of these two groups. From here, it's kind of disputed if she was bought or if she was won in a gamble, but a French-Canadian trapper named Toussaint Charbonneau gained ownership of her over this time. He then made Sakagawea one of his wives. And I'm going to be honest with you guys, this guy seemed like a total douche, okay? A few years before forcing Sakagawea to be his wife, he was stabbed for raping a young Salto woman. A recorder of this previous expedition mentioned the stabbing was, quote, a fate he highly deserved for his brutality, end quote. So yeah, Toussaint Charbonneau seems kind of like a jerk. Around the same time that Sacagawea and Toussaint were getting together, President Thomas Jefferson had bought the Louisiana Purchase, and he needed some brave young people to explore the new territory. He appointed his secretary, Meriwether Lewis, as the head of the Corps of Discovery, whose mission was to create maps of the territory and maybe hopefully find the Northwest Passage. For anyone who doesn't know, the Northwest Passage is a waterway connecting the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, and if it was discovered, it would be really great for trade and more exploration and probably some more colonialism. Yikes. So Lewis needs a co-captain at this point for this huge expedition, right? And he picks his friend and fellow military peer, William Clark. Together, they gather about 40 U.S. Army and civilian recruits. Clark and some of the members head out from Camp Dubois, Illinois on May 14, 1804, and they meet up with Lewis and the remaining recruits in St. Louis, Missouri. After they all finally met up, Lewis and Clark are and the members traveled about six months until they made it to the Hidatsa Mandian settlement where Sacagawea and Toussaint were. The group decided to stay in the settlement over the winter to kind of wait out the cold and kind of recover before moving on with their journey. Lewis and Clark at this point realized that they would need a Shoshone interpreter in order to buy horses in the future when they were trying to pass through the Bitterroot Mountains. Since Toussaint spoke French and Hidatsa and Sacagawea spoke Shoshone and Hidatsa, they were able to kind of speak with one another throughout a chain of translation. 
so it was a little tedious at times but at least they were able to sort of understand the idea that everybody was trying to get or get across and it was very helpful in the future when they were able to understand Shoshone language. All while this planning was going on, Sakagawea was about six months pregnant. And about two months before they set out on their journey, she gave birth to a little baby boy named Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau. Clark actually nicknamed him Pomp. So from here on out, I'm just going to call him Little Pomp because that's the cutest nickname ever. In April, the gang headed out to Fort Medan using these little boats called pirogues. These boats actually had to be pulled against current at times or even like pulled over riverbanks. So it wasn't like they were, you know, just hanging out on a little speedboat. They were doing a lot of physical activity to try and get these boats throughout, you know, shallow and deeper waters. In May of 1805, uh, Charbonneau and Sacagawea's boat was actually hit by a squall which is kind of like a localized storm and it threatened to capsize their boat. So they were kind of shaking around. It was made a little worse by the fact that Toussaint was panicking a little bit. And at one point, some of the documents and journals that they had had in the boat fell out. Sakagawea was very quick to think on her feet and she jumped in the water, grabbed all of the stuff out and saved it which she was revered for by the rest of the team. Now, it's important to understand that if these documents were lost, it would have pretty much permanently destroyed some of the historical context that we have for this expedition. So some of the things that were revived from the water were actually some of Lewis's notebooks and journals documenting all of the expedition. So these documents would have been lost if it wasn't for her quick thinking. By this point, the rest of the crew really hated Charbonneau. He was pretty incompetent with a boat, and he was frequently hitting both of his wives, um, Sakagawea and his other wife, Otter Woman. And the crew had also heard about his brutal rape that I had mentioned earlier, so nobody really liked him at this point. However, it seemed by this point that Sakagawea was actually boosting morale for the rest of the group especially after she was able to interpret for some of the Shoshone tribesmen that they encountered throughout their journey. The group ran into a Shoshone tribe in August of 1808, and Sakagawea was actually able to help out and interpret all of the interactions with these folks. Coincidentally, Sakagawea actually had family as part of this tribe, and the chief was actually her brother. Um, this seemed to be the first time that Sakagawea had expressed a lot of emotion uh, from the understanding of Lewis and Clark. And one of the recorders, Nicholas Biddle, wrote that when Sakagawea first saw someone she recognized, she, quote, began to dance and show every mark of the most extravagant joy, end quote. She hasn't seen her brother by this point, but Lewis and Clark wanted to have a discussion with the chief and they asked Sakagawea to be their interpreter for the interaction. So when her brother walked into the tent, she instantly recognized him. She, quote, instantly jumped up and ran and embraced him, throwing over him her blanket and weeping profusely. End quote. This is such a beautiful description of their reunion to me because I just really couldn't even imagine what kind of hardship she had to go through. She was kidnapped when she was young, taken as a child bride to somebody who she really didn't know, and wow. she might have been even forced uh, to go on this expedition. You know, it's not like she really had much of a choice, but neither here nor there. We don't really know the uh, nuance of her opinions, but it was just beautiful for her to be able to see her family on this expedition. Unfortunately, she wasn't really able to stay with her family for very long, and she continued on the expedition with the Corps of Discovery. And since the group was able to barter with the Shoshone tribe for some horses, they were finally able to cross the Rocky Mountains. Although, like, this wasn't a fun little glamping <laughs> type of trip. It was really, really hard. So this group was actually reduced to eating tallow candles because of how difficult it was to come across food at certain points. When they finally made it out of the harsh climate, there were actually some camas roots that Sakagawea was able to forage for. And the camas roots are kind of like these little onion things. So she was able to cook those up, uh, forage for them, and that also boosted some morale. In November of 1805, the group ran into another tribe who wanted to trade with them. One of the men of this other group was wearing a cloak made of otter skin, 
and Lewis and Clark thought it would be a wonderful gift for President Thomas Jefferson when they came back from their expedition. Unfortunately, they didn't have enough tradable goods to get the cloak, and so they were a little bit sad about that. But the tribesman who was wearing the otter skin cloak kind of looked around and he was like, hey, I see that belt on that girl. Uh, can I have it? It's unclear if Sakagawea gave up the belt voluntarily or if she was forced to give it up, but regardless, in the end, the belt was given up to the men and it was used for the trade and they got the otter skin cloak in the end. I want to dive into kind of the importance of this belt a little bit more because I don't know if people really discuss this all that much. When I came across the information, I was kind of like, wow, I wouldn't have given up the belt voluntarily. I would have been like, no, it's mine. It means a lot. So there was a lot of importance behind it. So of course, many people thought that this was a very kind gesture from Sakagawea to offer up her belt. But if she was forced to give it up, it just makes this story even more tragic to me. So while Sakagawea was in captivity within the Hidatsa and Mandian settlement, she must have gained favor with the older women and more influential women of this society because they would have presented her with this belt. And these belts were only given to the hardworking and sensible women of the tribe. She must have been seen as very well grounded for her age, especially for her to be given this kind of important belt. So this belt must have meant a, a lot to her because it was earned in a place where she didn't really know who the people were and she'd only been there for a short amount of time. Regardless of if she gave up the belt voluntarily or not, at the end of the day, she was compensated for uh, giving it up. So at least there was that. <laughs> so this closed out the journey of the expedition. And on September 23rd, 1805, their over 8,000 mile journey had come to an end. After the expedition, Clark had offered to set up Charbonneau and Sacagawea in St. Louis, Missouri, but they refused for a couple of years. After a few more years of living with the Hidatsa Mandan tribe, Sacagawea and Toussaint did take up Clark on his offer because they did want to get little Pomp educated. And in 1812, the couple actually went on to have a daughter named Lizette. I think it's worth noting that Sacagawea's presence overall at the expedition was really a calming presence. She had a lot of indirect effects on the expedition, I think, by being more of a calming presence to the people who they came across. So when they would come across a group of Native American people who, you know, maybe didn't know are, are these people here to hurt us, it kind of calmed down the tensions to see a woman with a small baby kind of within this group you know it made them feel a little bit more safe because why would this group of men be traveling with a woman and a small child if they were out to hurt us this probably significantly decreased the risk of conflict within the journey which was probably good overall because if they had gotten into a lot of conflict they probably wouldn't have made it as far as they did there are a few different theories surrounding Sakagawea's death and I want to explore each one a little bit more. After the expedition, she and Charbonneau were living at a trading post near Bismarck, North Dakota. At this time, a journalist, Henry Breckenridge, wrote that Sacagawea was ill, quote, and longed to revisit her native country, end quote. And on December 20th, 1812, John Luddick, the, force, the fort's chief clerk, wrote in his logbook that Sacagawea had quote, died of a putrid fever, end quote. Further proof for this theory notes that in 1813, adoption papers for Pomp and Lizette required both parents to be dead in order for the children to be considered orphans and therefore be considered for adoption. Other theories suggest that Sacagawea did not die in 1812, but much later. Native American oral traditions recount that Sacagawea left Charbonneau and married into the Comanche tribe. She is said to have rejoined with the Shoshone tribe in Wyoming in 1860, 
where she lived until her death in 1884. While these accounts are not written anywhere, they are part of the oral history of the tribes local to these areas. According to the oral narrative, a Shoshone woman named Porivo had claimed she was part of the Lewis and Clark expedition and had lived in Wyoming with her two sons, Basil and Baptiste, who spoke several ling languages, including English and French. She said when her husband died, she returned to her ancestral lands at the Wind River Indian Reservation where she died on April 9th, 1884. Many people believe this woman to be Sacagawea. So that is all I have for you on the history of Sacagawea. Um, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Um, I had a really great time learning about Sacagawea's life. I always thought that she was just really a navigator for the Lewis and Clark expedition, but it seems like her roles were a lot more nuanced and I really enjoyed learning about that. So I hope you did too. Thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.